Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another one of Mr. Lang's vlogs. Today, we're talking about the causes of the Civil War. Now, first, I want to point out that, of course, uh, during this, because it has to do with the Civil War, you may see some Confederate flags. Now, remember, uh, in the historical context in which we're using these, this is a flag of a former nation, the nation that is the Confederate States of America. Okay? Unfortunately, we know that people have uh, used this flag to represent other uh, really uh, horrible parts um, and horrible things such as racism in our country. Do know that we're only using this historically, okay? And obviously, do not condone any of that other behavior. All right, and with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get started. So here we are looking at the causes of this civil war. One of the most important parts in our nation's history as it truly tested if we could survive uh, and, well, we do persevere, spoiler alert, but again, it isn't without a lot, a lot of bloodshed. So, first we got to talk about how we got there. Now, the big question was, should slavery be allowed in the new territories? The United States was expanding uh, at an incredible rate, but should slavery continue in these new territories? That's what the issue was up to the Civil War, and we see that, of course, it's only going to erupt into war because of this uh, argument. So it all started really, if you want to go back to the Missouri Compromise. Now, we talked about the Missouri Compromise earlier. Essentially, if you remember, the Missouri Compromise went ahead and said Maine can become a free state, which, of course, was part of Massachusetts back then. Missouri would become a slave state, and slavery would be outlawed in any new state north of Missouri's southern border. Now, that really only extended until the border of Mexico at the time, as, of course, Mexico did own all the area you see on the map right here. So, again, that line technically only extended right to there. The issue comes after, because years later, we had to go ahead and we expanded. Now, why was it important to maintain a balance between free and slave states in Congress? See, you remember, because equality ensured that not, no one side would have the power to pass a law regarding slavery that the other side disliked. They had to keep that equilibrium. Remember, if this, there were more southern states, they could solidify slavery anywhere in the U.S., uh, as again, they'd have the majority of the votes in Congress. Vice versa, if there was more northern states, they could abolish slavery. And, well, they could go ahead and when they abolish it, it everywhere because they had more majority vote in Congress because there were more northern states. So they had to keep it equal. And that's why we see such a huge issue going forward. Now, if you look at the southern population here, you'll notice that uh, in some cases, slaves outnumbered whites. And oftentimes, I always get students that ask, well, then why didn't they just rise up? Well, don't forget, unfortunately, slaves were not uh, educated and they weren't they couldn't own a, a firearm or anything like that. And so the whites did. They did own firearms. They could organize if need be as they were educated. And so it would be hard for slaves to organize as well. So we're going to see some slave uprisings during this time. But they aren't going to be as bountiful as you would think. Um, so again, this kind of gives you a look at what the South looked like prior to the Civil War. Now... Another thing we talked about earlier in one of our virtual classrooms is the slave-owning population. Uh, only around 350,000 families own slaves out of the white population of 6 million. And so you kind of look at, okay, we have 347,525 families. Uh, most were owning one to four slaves because they're yeoman farmers. And being a yeoman farmer, they, you know, they work alongside uh, their slave in the field. Now, slavery, as we know, is absolutely horrible. Again, owning another human being is atrocious. But when you look at this, you kind of see, okay, only 350,000 families own slaves. Why was there such a big war over slavery? Why didn't they just say, okay, you, you, okay, we're going to get rid of slavery. There's not that many people that have it. Well, the answer really is because, unfortunately, the Southern whites, a lot of them felt that it was their right to own a slave. They felt that if you took that right away, that was like taking away free speech in their case. Which we know today is not true. It's absolutely horrible to think of it that way. But that's unfortunately how they thought back in 1850. So even if people didn't own a slave, they still supported slavery in most cases. Especially because it was such a big part of the economy back then. Especially for the South, a big part of the economy. 
So what are some characteristics of the South? Well, like we talked about before, it's primarily agricultural. Um, so they're very much into crops, farming, etc. It's slavery, it's cotton. These are two essential parts of their economy. Again, one you needed one with the other, at least they thought. Um, again, we know today you don't, but back then that's what they thought. Um, there's very little industrialization, which is going to hurt them during the war, which again, when we get to the war, we'll talk about that. And overall, it was a very inadequate transportation system. When you think about the railroads, they're going to be all in the north as well. That's where you know, we have shipping for different factories. In the south, they didn't have that much, uh, that many railroads that at least were connecting enough for them to really utilize as well as the north will. So all was really quiet from 1820 until the Mexican Cession, which we talked about. So during the Mexican War, uh, slavery became an issue again because we won the war and then we gained all this land in the Mexican Cession. And we had to decide whether or not to allow slavery in this land. Uh, again, the land that is currently California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, parts of New Mexico, etc. Are we gonna allow slavery in this new territory? That becomes a big issue. And of course, as you can see here, that's a big chunk of land. And that's not the only chunk of land we got, as we talked about during Manifest Destiny. We got a huge chunk of a lot of this land, and now we have to figure out what, if we're going to allow slavery out there. That's the issue. And so in 1850, we have a compromise. The Compromise of 1850. It's a very original name, I know. <laughs> so California becomes a free state. Uh, they, it has to become a free state, because you're going to have to keep that equilibrium, right? Although that doesn't exactly happen. Instead, something new called popular sovereignty, which allows the people to decide whether or not uh, slavery would exist in these new territories of New Mexico and Utah. And the slave trade, now not slavery, but the slave trade, would be abolished in Washington, D.C. The reason why is because they felt it was an embarrassment that you could buy another human being right down the street from the White House. And what I say to that is then get rid of slavery. But I digress, because in 1850 they weren't thinking like that. Instead, they masked the problem by just simply saying no more slave auctions here in Washington, D.C. And then for the, probably the worst part of this entire, um, really this entire uh, act right here, this compromise, is the strong, stronger future of slave law. This made it so Northerners and Southerners, again, stressing the Northerners, were responsible to capture runaway slaves and turn them in. Oftentimes, it's up to bounty hunters who would capture innocent African Americans who were free in some cases and send them into slavery. The South saw this as a funnel of free slaves, and unfortunately for a time it was. And we see huge issues rise up because of this, and huge voices are going to come out. Thank goodness. So, Let's go over some vocabulary, some of the stuff that we saw earlier. Now, popular sovereignty is when you have the people in the territory decide whether or not to allow slavery in that particular territory. You also have the Fugitive Slave Law, which the Fugitive Slave Law requires all citizens, both northern and southern, to go ahead and capture and uh, help capture and return runaway slaves. So again, we have two laws that the South really does enjoy, yet obviously the northerners aren't going to like. This was a big defeat against the, uh, when it comes to the fight against slavery, for sure. Now, sectionalism at its worst came out really in Congress. Uh, the Senator Charles Sumner from Massachusetts actually is beaten with a cane by Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina. As a political cartoon shows, uh, it's actually the, um, they, they consider it the Southern chivalry. Now, Charles Sumner, unfortunately, uh, was a very tall man, and so he was uh, kind of caught underneath the desks in, in Congress that would, were bolted down to the floor. And so when Preston Brooks started to wail on him, um, well, he actually was injured very bad, and there was a vacant seat in the uh, Massachusetts Senate for quite a while. And unfortunately, Southerners took this, didn't take this seriously at all, and actually sent Preston Brooks like new canes saying next time beat him harder uh, it's horrible we literally have two literally the north and the south fighting in congress uh, because of all this it's crazy and then we get to the Dred Scott decision in 1857 which brings up the question if a slave is brought to a free state does that make him or her automatically free well in this case 
we're going to see it's going to be a very, very convoluted thing. So first, who is Dred Scott? Well, Dred Scott was an African-American who was a slave. And his master, who's down there, you can see him pictured, is going to be the, he's an officer in the U.S. Army. What's going to happen is he's going to bring his slave uh, to a free territory and a free state. And of course, he's going to live on free soil for a very long time. Now, unfortunately, Scott's master passed. He died. Uh, and because of that, what we see is, of course, you know, Dred Scott living on free soil for so long says, hey, I should be free. And this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now, he was helped. Scott was helped by anti-slavery lawyers um, to sue for his freedom in court, claiming he should be free since he had lived on free soil for so long. So what events caused this? Well, Dr. John Emerson, who was his owner, um, was stationed in Missouri, moves to Illinois, free state, moves to Wisconsin, a non-slave state, and then moves back to Missouri, passes away shortly after. So there's two sides of this argument, right? You have Dred Scott's side, who said lived in a non-slave area long enough to be considered a free man. His owner passed away, therefore he does not have an owner, technically, although he was willed to another one, uh, to another person. And then you have the U.S. Supreme Court saying that Dred Scott's not a citizen because he was a slave and that Congress has no right to control a person's property. This was a major defeat. In the Supreme Court case, it was decided that slaves were not citizens and could not bring suit to court. So this case was eventually essentially just thrown out of court. And that's because slaves are considered property. That's as crazy as thinking that the, the, the device you're watching this video on, again, has the same amount of rights as a slave back then. It's disgusting. It goes further though, because now you have the Fifth Amendment, which protects people's property. Well, basically say that because slaves are property, Congress can't ban slavery in any of the territories. Southerners were overjoyed with this, this horrible decision. And today we know it was a very bad decision. And it was passed down by uh, Roger Taney, a uh, very famous Chief Justice. Years later, his family will apologize to Scott's family. It was very nice in around 2017. So later, John Sanford, who sued to have um, a New Yorker, mind you, uh, sued to have uh, Dred Scott still as a slave, does have a mental breakdown, becomes insane, and dies in a New York asylum. So then Sanford got Scott because uh, he inherited him from uh, Dr. John Emerson. Now, because they both died, Scott got sent back to Irene Emerson, who does go ahead and free Dred Scott and his wife Harriet. Um, it is crazy because if you're looking already, you're like, whoa, a spelling mistake, Mr. Lang. That's not true at all. In fact, the spelling mistake was on the behalf of the courts. Uh, they spelt Sanford wrong. It's actually spelled S-A-N-F-O-R-D, uh, as that's John Sanford's last name. And they, on the books, put a D. And so when we talk about it as a case, it does have a D. When we talk about the person, it does not. So pretty crazy, right? Alrighty, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Published in 1852 by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now this book becomes an anti-slavery bestseller. Why? Well, because of what this represented. Now, Harriet Beecher Stowe was a northerner. She was an absolutely an ab abolitionist. Again, wanted to get rid of slavery. And it really does become one of the most influential books ever in U.S. history, for sure. Um, what it does is it dramatizes the cruelties of slavery, selling over 300,000 copies in within the first year. Now, why is it so important? Well, this anti-slavery bestseller is going to be one rift between the North and the South. Northerners, this, helped, this book helped change the way they felt about slavery. Oftentimes, now they see it as a moral issue that they could no longer ignore, especially because there is graphic scenes in the book about the treatment of slaves. Now, Southerners were outraged by the book, claiming that this book, which was eventually made into a play, did not give a true picture of slave life. I will say this is one of the most important books in American history, hands down. Alrighty, so what are the three views of slavery during this era? Well, first you have an abolitionist who wanted to end slavery in the U.S. completely. Then you have a moderate, which is what we're going to talk about with Abraham Lincoln. This is what he is. He wanted to stop the spread of slavery in the U.S. at first. Now obviously we know he changed his mind during the Civil War, and whether or not he really believed uh, he was really an abolitionist in private, but publicly was a moderate, we'll never know. Uh, oftentimes abolitionists were seen as very radical, and I don't think 
that if Abraham Lincoln was an abolitionist during the elections we're going to be talking about, I don't think he would have won in the election of 1860. And then you have pro-slavery, which feels that slavery was wrong, uh, was not wrong and felt that slavery was their right. So there's really three categories, three views of slavery in the world at this time, especially in the U.S. Now, the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 is going to cause another rift between Northerners and Southerners. It was proposed by Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas. We haven't heard the last of him yet. What happens is pretty simple. He proposed in the Kansas-Nebraska Act that for these two territories right here, Nebraska and Kansas, with enough people to become territories, uh, the question of slavery comes up again. Should we allow slavery there? And he says, we will uh, open it to popular sovereignty. Again, have a vote, have people decide whether or not to allow slavery there. But what would this void? What would this cancel out that we already talked about earlier in this virtual classroom? You got it. The Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise said that you could not allow slavery above that, that line. Yet here we are. Oh, could possibly have slavery above that line because of popular sovereignty, letting the people decide whether or not to allow slavery there through a vote. So, the Kansas-Nebraska Act says that the Louisiana Purchase, the last real parts of it, um, are going to be divided into two territories, Kansas and Nebraska. And of those two territories, both are going to have popular sovereignty used to decide if slavery would be allowed in those territories. So what happens when people are asked to decide whether or not to allow slavery in a territory? Well, it becomes a mess. In fact, we often had uh, border hoppers that would go hop the border from Missouri over to Kansas and vote to allow slavery and then vote and then hop back over the border. This all leads to Bleeding Kansas. Bleeding Kansas is where essentially popular sovereignty led to a small scale civil war in Kansas. What happens is that there is bloodshed between the people of both Kansas and Nebraska territories over slavery. Battles are going to break out between pro-slavery settlers and anti-slavery settlers and over 200 are going to die in the course of four months. It is a legit war zone uh, in Kansas at this point. Uh, very famously, the Potawatomi Massacre, led by John Brown, who was an abolitionist, someone against slavery, is going to be a very big event during this bleeding Kansas. Now, during this time, we get the Republican Party. Now, the Republican Party is very different from what you think of today. Uh, in fact, the Republican Party was created in 1856 by Northerners, who were committed to stopping the spread of slavery. Back then, Republicans were very liberal, Democrats were very conservative meaning that Republicans are basically like Democrats today and Democrats back then are like Republicans today. Very confusing. In fact, fun fact, in 1932, that's when we see the shift between that where Republicans become more conservative like they are today and Democrats become more liberal like they are today as well. So this was really the first time we had a sectional political party developed over the issue of slavery. Now, the Republican Party originally was called the Free Soil Party and you know, obviously they wanted to stop the spread of slavery. They wanted more free soil. Uh, but they are eventually going to change their name to the Republican Party and eventually adopt the elephant as their symbol. And who is the first, one of the first people in the Republican Party? Abraham Lincoln. In fact, spoiler alert, he's going to be our first Republican president of all time. Now, Lincoln believed uh, at this point in time that slavery was a moral wrong. It was morally wrong. It was bad. But he wasn't an abolitionist. He wasn't ready to get rid of it yet. In fact, he's going to be more so to stop the spread of it. That's what he wants at this point. We're going to see that he's going to change his mind, especially during the Civil War. However, you know, we really don't even don't know to this day if he privately was an abolitionist and publicly didn't say that because he wouldn't have been taken as seriously had he not had he actually said that, unfortunately. So what comes out of Lincoln? going for the Senate seat in Illinois in 1858? Why, the very famous Lincoln-Douglas debates for the position of Illinois Senator. Abraham Lincoln, who was opposed to slavery spreading in the territories, goes up against Stephen Douglas, the guy who invented popular sovereignty. Let the people decide. Now, these series of debates, just a sample of what was going on around the country, of people th people's different thoughts. So Abraham Lincoln goes ahead and does not win. 
Oh, he lost the Senate seat. Stephen Douglas wins the Senate seat here in 1858. However, the debates are so important as they really show what the country was doing, and that's struggling to keep together. 1859, we get something else that happens that's going to lead to the Civil War, and that's the John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Now, John Brown was an abolitionist who tried to raid a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, now located in West Virginia. His plan was to go ahead and arm slaves uh, and start a slave uprising. And what's going to happen is he's going to be caught. In fact, he's going to have a shootout with Colonel Marine Robert E. Lee. Yes, that Robert E. Lee. Um, he is going to lose. Uh, he's going to be captured. And he's going to be hung the next day. Um, again, John Brown was a very radical abolitionist. He wanted to get rid of slavery. But again, he really felt that all the legislator and legislation and the laws was doing nothing. And that he could do something through action. And that's where we get a big debate with him, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And like I said, he was captured, he's put on trial, convicted of murder, treason, and unfortunately hung. So you can see here that many people are conflicted in this country between is he a hero or is he a villain? Is he a hero or a madman? Well, if you're in the northern, if you're a northerner, odds are you thought he was a hero. Because many people saw him as a martyr. Now, a martyr is someone who gives their life for the cause um, because he was willing to do that. In fact, Northerners saying the John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. Now, the South, on the other hand, is very different. They're outraged by Brown's actions. In fact, many become convinced that North wanted to destroy slavery because of what happened here in Harper's Ferry. And so because of this raid on Harper's Ferry, where John Brown, again, wasn't successful... Well, it's going to lead to a bigger rift, a huge rift between the North and the South. And of course, the Civil War is going to be shortly after. Now, it's not the reason for the Civil War, as really we can pinpoint right here. The election of 1860, that is the issue that we see that's going to lead to some of the first states leaving the United States. There are four candidates for the presidency. You have Stephen Douglas. He's for Northern Democrats. He believed in popular sovereignty. They can let the people decide whether or not to allow slavery to expand. You have John Breckinridge, Southern Democrat, who's pro-slavery. John Bell, part of the Constitutional Union Party. He just wanted to keep the Union together. And of course, Abraham Lincoln, who's a Republican, who wanted to stop the spread of slavery. Now notice, it's a rematch. Stephen Douglas may have won the Senate seat after the Lincoln-Douglas debates in Illinois in 1858, but now this is for the presidency. This is for the big boys now, so what's going to happen next is going to change history forever. But what this, rep this election represents is something referred to as sectionalism. Sectionalism is when you have a loyalty to a region or state as opposed to the nation as a whole. And unfortunately we see this quite a bit uh, during this time. This political cartoon demonstrates that perfectly. As of course you've got poor John Bell trying to put the union back together. It's, as you can tell, it's not going to work because, you know, it's a little bit of glue and it's a lot of bit of ripping. Uh, you have Stephen Douglas, you have Abraham Lincoln, and John Breckinridge ripping and tearing this map, which represents the United States apart. We're going to see that in the end, the Republican Abraham Lincoln is going to win. In fact, he's going to win. As crazy as it sounds. With less than 40% of the vote, 39.9%, he wins this, this election. The problem is, South Carolina said that if Abraham Lincoln won, they would leave the Union. Sure enough, they did. Many Southerners are going to support what we call secession. Secession is to withdraw from the country, to literally leave. Now, they're not going to physically leave. Uh, they're going to instead go ahead and not recognize the United States as their government and create their own. Because to many Northerners, Lincoln's election meant that the South no longer had a voice and that they would act that Lincoln, now that he's elected, would be a dictator and would get rid of slavery. They believe both president and Congress together were against their interests. And so the first state to secede, South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, and what we see is, of course, they're not the only ones. In December 20th, 1860, Lincoln was elected. He was the president-elect. 
but they didn't presidents back then didn't get inaugurated till March Pres, President Lincoln wasn't even in office yet and the country was already leaving so that might bring up the question who was president well James Buchanan was president at the time and Buchanan wasn't doing anything uh, again he was publicly saying like no don't do it South Carolina don't leave other states don't don't leave but he didn't really put forth a lot of action Lincoln's gonna be the one that takes action and I believe as many historians do that a lot of this is because Buchanan felt it was probably Lincoln's problem and that's why he didn't react the way he probably should have so the progression of secession is pretty uh, pretty interesting you at first have as you can see here on the map the red is the Union States the border states are the blue here. They're going to be still part of the United States, but they're going to have special laws, including allowing slavery, as we didn't want them to leave, especially Maryland. Our capital, Washington, D.C., is in and surrounded by Maryland. You have the first secession, which is the states that seceded before the fall of Fort Sumter. That's in blue. These states leave before Lincoln even gets into office. Once the shots are fired on Fort Sumter in April of 1861, that's when the states secede, these gray states secede afterwards. They form the Confederacy. There's 11 southern states altogether that join this, uh, this new nation um, called the Confederacy, officially called the Confederate States of America, or the CSA. You'll see it on the belt buckles during the Civil War of the, uh, of the soldiers. The Jefferson Davis was elected as president. Richmond, Virginia is selected as the capital of the Confederacy. And here we have a nation, a union broken and a new nation formed. Now it's interesting because of course Lincoln's never going to actually view the South as its own nation. He actually views it as a lost brother and that we need to bring back. But unfortunately they were recognized as a, as a, a legit nation. They in fact had talks uh, with uh, foreign nations as well including England to help hopefully join the war thank goodness they did not um, and it was just the the Union versus the Confederacy the first shots get fired at Fort Sumter in 1861 on April 11th in this little fort in Charleston South Carolina the Confederacy demanded that the US troops leave the fort and they take it over Lincoln said hold on to the fort in fact Lincoln kept sending supplies he wanted the South to attack first that way it looks like the South is the aggressor during this war now Major Robert Anderson refused to surrender the fort as was ordered to again Confederate guns open fire on April 12th and Anderson surrenders the fort shortly after marking the start of the Civil War now it's interesting because of course when uh, if you go there which I've been there it's a fantastic uh, you know visit you take a ferry out there um, nobody actually died during the battle our first casualty of this uh, entire war was during Fort Sumter it was during the 21 gun salute during the surrender one of the cannons backfired and uh, killed a guy as our first casualty of the war no one was actually killed here at Fort Sumter and when you get if you ever get a chance to go there you can still see the cannonballs lodged into the walls uh, of the fort and there's also a World War II uh, battery on there that would, that would you know was watching on the East Coast uh, for any Germans during there so you kind of get a you know two wars two US wars right there um, with one visit so I'm gonna leave you with this a very famous quote by Abraham Lincoln which I think sums up the situation of the United States at this point until we continue our virtual classroom next time he believed the nation could not survive if it remained divided by slavery and he very famously said prior to the Civil War a house is divided against itself cannot stand I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free I do not expect the Union to be dissolved I do not expect the house to fall but I do expect it will cease to be divided it will all become one thing or all the other what was Lincoln's house he was referring to exactly it's the United States of America and as you can see this quote sums up exactly what the country's going through prior to the Civil War and of course the Civil War is going to change this nation forever we're gonna get into that in our next unit thank you for joining me and I'll catch you back in the classroom